Hello, everyone! I'm Miko Sanchez, and we are back! Yay! Welcome to episode 25 of Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. That's right. We were gone for quite a long time, my friends. It's been a long time since our last episode. Oh, boy. I can't believe it. We were gone for quite a long time. And now we are back and ready to bring you another episode ready for you guys. That's right, my friends. Movie History Walt Disney Anime Studios is now back in session. Yay! I can't believe it, guys. We are finally back. I'm so happy to have this show back on board. Man, this is going to be so exciting. That's right. Movie History Walt Disney Anime Studios is finally back in business, ladies and gentlemen. I can't believe you guys. We are back in session. Yeah, our last episode was all the way back on July 22nd. Yeah, July 22nd was our last episode, but now we never have we never had an episode. We never got one in August, September, October, and November. Now it's been nearly five months since our last episode, and now we're back! Yay! So thank you all for coming, and welcome to Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. We're finally back in business, ladies and gentlemen, and now we're ready to bring you more content for you guys. That's why right. I have to put the show on hiatus because. Because the house was currently in renovation, but now we're back and ready to bring you some more new videos for you guys. So thank you all for coming and welcome to Movie History. Walt Disney Animation Studios. We got more episodes coming away through through now and through through now all the way up to 2022. That's so bracing some people. It's gonna be exciting. So get ready for it. All right, are you ready? Then let's do it. For episode 25, we're looking at the Black Cauldron. That's right, my friends. The first logo, the first movie to feature the newly redesigned Walt Disney Pictures logo. This is going to be so exciting, my friends. So are you ready for it? Good. And you have to see episode 24. Again, 222 was our previous episode. Uh, What's the last time I did this episode? It was about the fox and the hound. So watch it now. The link to it is up there on the top recording screen. Click up the video and see it for yourself. Right now, let's begin. Shall we? Are you ready? Now, here we go. So about the movie. The Black Cauldron is a 1985 American anime dark fantasy adventure film produced by Walt Disney Productions in association with Silver Screen. In association with Silver Screen 2. And Silver Screen Partners 2, and, and released by Walt Disney Pictures, the 25th animated dis, the, yeah, the 25th Disney animated feature film is loosely based on the first two books in the Chronicles of, of Pride Dean by Lloyd Alexander, a series of five novels that are in turn based on Welsh mythology set in the mythical land of Pride Dean during the early Middle Ages. The film centers on a wicked emperor known as the Horned King, who hopes to secure an ancient magical cauldron that will aid him in desire in his desire to conquer the world. He is opposed by young swineherd Tarot, the young princess, the the the, 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 the heart playing uh, bar, uh, bard, for the, the few the flu de flam, and a friendly wild creature named Gurgi, who seeks to destroy the cauldron to prevent the war king from 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 the world. The film is directed by Ted Burbitt and Richard Rich, who had directed Disney's previous anime film, The Fox and the Hound, in 1981. It was the first Disney anime film to be recorded in Dolby Stereo. Disney acquired the rights to books in 1973, with production beginning in 1980, set for Christmas 1984 release. During production, it uh, during production it had several editing it had a several editing a severe editing process, particularly for its climactic sequence, which proved to be disturbing for children. Which yeah, disturbing to children. The newly appointed Walt Disney Studios chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg ordered those scenes to be cut, featuring that it would, uh, featuring that, uh, fearing that it would, uh, that, that it would alienate children. As a result, it was delayed to 1985. It features the voices of Grant Barnsley, Susan Sheridan, Freddie Jones, Nigel Hawthorne, Arthur, Arthur Mallet, John Byer, Phil, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Fonacaro, and John Hurt. It was the first Disney animated film. To receive a PG rating, as well as the first Disney animated film to feature computer-generated imagery, the film was distributed theatrically through Warner Bros. Distribution on July 24, 1985, to mixed reviews, with critical with critics voicing disappointing uh, disapproval of its dark nature and disjointed writing. Through though the animation, soundtrack, and voice acting were praised, being the most expensive animated film ever made at the time. It was a box office bomb, grossing just $21 million against a bunch of $44 million, putting the future of Disney's animated, animation department in jeopardy. Because of its commercial failure, Disney did not release the film on home video until 1998. <sighs> yes, all guys, so we take a look at this here. It's a big one. Directed by Ted Berman and Richard Rich. Produced story by Ted Berman, Vance, Jerry, Joe Hale, David Jonas, Roy, uh, Marilla, Richard Rich. Art Stevens, Al Wilson, Peter Young, Ron, Ron Clements, and John Musker, based on the book Three in the Black Cauldron by Lloyd Alexander, produced by Joe Hale and Ron Miller, 
starring Grant Bartley, Susan Sheridan, Freddie Jones, Nigel Hawthorne, Arthur Mallet, John Byer, Phil Bonacaro, and John Hurt, narrated by John Huston, uh, Huston, edited by James Melton, Jim uh, Jim Comfort, uh, Art Meta, Jackson, and Jeffy Casper, music by Albert Bernstein. Production companies are Walt Disney Pictures, Walt Disney Productions, and Silver Screen Partners 2, distributed by Buena Vista Distribution, release date July 24th, 1985. Running time, eight, yeah, running time is eight minutes. Yeah, running time is eight minutes. For, the country is the United States language English. Box budget, the budget forty four million dollars. Box office twenty one point three million dollars. That's why it's a failure. So that, uh, let's get to the plot of the story. In the land of Pride, Tyrod, a teenage boy and assistant pig keeper on the small farm of Care Dalbin, home of Dalbin the Enchanter, dreams of being becoming a famous warrior. Dalbin learns the evil Horned King searching is searching for a mystic. Uh, a mystical relic, relic known as the Black Cauldron, which can create an invincible army of undead warriors, the Cauldron Born. Dalban fears that uh, the Horn King might use his pig, Hen Wen, who had oracular powers, to locate the Cauldron. Dalban directs Tara to Hen uh, to take Hen Wen to safety. Unfortunately, Tara's foolish daydreaming causes Hen Wen to be captured by Quintin Thanes, the Horn King's dragon-like creatures. Tarad follows th them to the Horde King's castle and meets the pestering dog-like creature, Gurgi, who wants to be his friend. Frustrated by Gurgi's antics and cowardice, and cowardice, Tarad leaves him. Tarad sneaks into the castle and helps Henwen escape, but is captured and thrown into the dungeon. Another captive named Princess Aeloe frees him as she tries to escape. In the, cat in the catacombs of in the catacombs and underneath the castle, Tarad and Eloi would discover the ancient burial chamber of a king. Tarad arms himself with the king's sword, which, contain, which contains magic that allows him to effectively fight the Horde King's minions. That's thus fulfilling his dream. Along with the their prisoner, the comical middle-aged bard Flu, Fluter Flam, they escape from the castle and are found by Gurgi. Upon learning that Tarad has escaped, has escaped, the Horde King orders his goblin and chief henchman Creeper to send the quiet, uh, the quiet things to, uh, to, and to follow and capture Tarad along with his friends. Following Henwin's trail, the four companions stumble into the underground kingdom of the Fair Folk who have Henwin under their protection. When the kindly king and Eidlig reveals the cauldron's location, Tarad decides to destroy it. In a way, Gurgi and and Fluter agreed to join him and an uh, 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 obnoxious right hand man Dahl, the uh, Dolly, is assigned to lead them to the marshes of Morva while the fair folks escort head went back to scare Dalibin. Yeah, Dalibin. At Morva, they learned the cauldron is held by three witches the crafty leader, Ordu, the greedy Orgotch, and the more benevolent. Orin, who falls in love with Flu Fluter at first sight. Or to agree to take the to trade the culture for Tyrion's sword, and he reluctantly agrees, knowing it will cost knowing it will cost his chance for heroism. Before vanishing, the witches reveal the cauldron is indestructible, and its power can only be broken when when someone willingly climbs into it. And the witch will kill them. Dolly angrily abandons the group. Although Terran feels foolish for trading the sword for nothing, his companions show their belief in him. And Illumi and Terran almost kiss at almost kiss as Fluinder, uh, Fluder and Gurgi happily watch until Gurgi spoils the moment after giving Fluder a kiss on the cheek. Suddenly, they are found by the Horde King's minions who had. Who had followed him? Gurgi runs away, and, and before they take the cauldron and the three companions back to the castle, the Horde King uses the cauldron to raise the dead, and 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 his cauldron born army begins to pour out into the world while holding the trio prisoners in view, uh, in view of the cauldron. Oh <sighs> no! No, no. Gurgi, deciding not to abandon his friends this time, sneaks into the castle. And rescues them. Tarad decides to jump 
into the cauldron to save everyone. But Gurgi stops him and jumps instead, killing the cauldron porn as well as himself. When the Horde King spots Tarad, he blames him, saying Tarad has interfered for the last for the last time and throws the youth and throws the youth toward the cauldron. But the cauldron is out of control and consumes the Horde King in a tunnel of fire, killing him and destroying the castle, using up all its powers as the companions escape. The three witches come to recover the now in inner black cauldron. However, Tarad has finally realized Gurgi's true friendship while hailing him as a hero and asks them to revive his friend in exchange for the cauldron, choosing to give up his magical sword permanently upon hearing Lunar's challenging remarks to demonstrate their powers, the reluctant witches the reluctant witches honor the request, returning Gurgi to them. At first Gurgi appears to be dead and but is resurrected, much to everyone's joy. As after they reunite, he pushes Tarot and Elohi into a kiss. The four friends journey back home. They then journey back home to care Dune Dalbin, where Dalbin and Dully watch them in a vision created by Henwin. And Dalby finally praises Tarot for his heroism. Whew, so that's it. That's everything you need to know about the Black Culture. We have to take a little voice cast here. Grant Barnsley as Tarot, Suzanne Sheridan as Princess Elohi, Freddie Jones as Dalbin, Nigel Hawthorne as Fludor Flan. Arthur Mella as King um, and Idyllic, John Miner as Gurgi and Dolly, Phil Fondacaro as Creeper, John Hurt as the Horn King, Ida Race Murray as Ordu, Adele Malise Moray as Orwen, Billy Hayes as Orgot as Orgotch, Peter uh, Peter Renade, Winnie Awai, James uh, uh, Alamanzar, Fondacaro, Steve Hale, Phil Nibelik and Jack Lang as the Horn King's henchmen, and finally uh, we have John Huston as the narrator. So yeah, that's all. Moving on to the production, sorry about developments. It's going to be a lot of once again, you guys. Walt Disney Productions optioned Loy Alexander's five volume series in 1971, and pre production began work in 1973 when the film rights to Alexander's books were finally obtained. According to Ollie Johnson, it was he and Frank Thomas that convinced the studio to produce the, to produce the movie, and that it, if it had been done properly, it might be as good as Snow White because of the numerous storylines and with over and with over 30 characters in the original series. Several story artists and animators worked on the development of the uh, of the film through the 19, throughout the 1970s. When it was when it was originally slated for release in 1980, veteran artist Mel Shaw created an inspirational conceptual pastel sketches, which which future Disney. Which future Disney president and CEO Ron W. Miller considered to be too advanced for, yeah, for the animators. Therefore, in 1978, the studio pushed its release back. It released a back to Christmas 1984 due to their inability to animate realistic human characters. Its original release date would be later soon by the Fox and the Hound. During its development, during its development limbo, one of the one of those writers was veteran storyboard artist Vance Gary, who was. Uh, who was chosen to be uh, to create beat storyboards that would outline the plot, action, and locations. Having set up the three principal characters, Jerry adapted the Horned King into the into a big belled Viking who had who had a red beard, fiery temper, and wore a steel helmets helmet with two large horns. Desiring an exper experienced British screenwriter to write the screenplay, the studio signed Rosemary and Ange Six uh, Sisson onto the project. Oh boy. The first director attached to the project was animator John Musker. After he was proposed by the job by the production, as a, as, after he was proposed the job by production, had Tom Tom Willite as director. As director, Musker was assigned to expand several sequences in the first act, but they were eventually deemed too comic, uh, too, too comedic. When production on the Fox and the Hound had wrapped several feature animation directors. R. Stevens, Richard Rich, Ted Bourbon, and David the, the, the Minchiner became involved in the Black Cauldron. When Miller decided too many people were involved, he had decided Stevens was not appropriate to supervise the project, and you know, so he so he contacted Joe Hale, who was a longtime layout artist at Disney Studios, to serve as producer. With Hale as producer, actual production of the Black Cauldron officially began in 1980. He tossed he tossed visual character artwork. Submitted by Tim Burton, 
and a lot with the Fox and the Hound directors Richard Rich and Ted Berman, they desired a Sleeping Beauty style approach and brought Milt Call out of retirement to create character designs for Tara, Eloi, Flute Flum, and the other principal characters. He and the story team, including two story artists David Jonas and Al Wilson that Hale brought to the project, revised the film, capitalizing, uh, capitalizing the story of the first two books and making uh, making some considerable changes with the, which led to the departure of Sisson, who had creative differences with Hale and the two directors. Yeah, yeah, with Hale and the directors. Animators John Musker and Ron Clements, also signed creative differences, were removed from the project and began development on the Great Mouse Detective. Displeased with Van Scary's concept of the Horror King, Hale turned the Horror King into a thin creature donning, donning a hood and carrying a spectral presence with shadowed face and glowing red eyes. His role expanded into a composite villain, a composite villain of several characters from the books, Tehran and Illinois. A Lowy eventually acquired elements of the past designs and costumes of early Disney characters, especially the latter, who was drawn to resemble Princess Aurora. Whew. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Moving on to test screening and editing, as production continues, shortly before the shortly before the film's initially planned 1984 theatrical release, a test screening for the rough cut of the Black Cauldron was held at the studio's private theater in Burbank, California. At the film, the particular at the film, particularly the climactic cauldron board sequence, who uh, proved to be too intense and disturbing for the for the majority of the children in the audience, most of whom ran out uh, ran out of the theater in terror before it was even finished. The newly appointed Disney Studio Chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg ordered the cer ordered certain scenes from the Black Cauldron to be cut as a result of the of the length and the fear that their nature would alternate children. Since animated films were generally edited. In storyboard using uh, for storyboard using Lego reels, later known as animatics, storyboard storyboard shot sequentially and set temporarily audio tracks. Producer Joe Joe Hale objected to Katzenberg's demands. Katzenberg responded by having the film brought into an edit bay and editing the film himself. In fort of what Katzenberg was doing by Hale, the newly appointed Disney CEO Michael Eisner called Katzenberg in the editing room and was convinced him to stop. And convinced him to stop. Yeah, yeah. Though he didn't, uh, though he did what Eisner insisted, Katzenberg requested the, that the film be modified and delay its scheduled Christmas 1984 release to, January, to July 1985 so that the film could be reworked. The film was ultimately cut by 12 minutes, with existing scenes rewritten and, re and reanimated for continuity. Many of the scene, many of the cutscenes involved extended character interactions, but other trims involved violent content, including the undead culture of war. Who are, unused, who are used to as a horde armies as horde king's army in the final act of the film. While most of the sequence, while most of the scenes were seamless, were seamlessly removed from the film, the cauldron four sequence contains rather recognizable lapses because the removal of the scenes of the cauldron board mauling the henchmen, the henchmen, as well as one of them being dissolved by the mist, creates a jump in the film soundtrack. Oh no! Moving on to the animation as production concludes. Invented by David W. Spencer for the from the studio's still camera department, the Animation Photo Transfer Process, or APT, was first used for the Black Culture, which would enhance the technology which the rough animation would be processed onto celluloid. First, the rough animation would be photographed onto high contrast lithofilm, and the result and the resulting negative would be copied onto the plastic cell sheets that would transfer lines and the colors. Which eventually eliminated, which eventually eliminated the hand inking process, process. But as the APT transferred line art would fade off to of the cells over time, most or all of the film was done using zero, using the zeographic process, which have been in place at Disney since late, since the late 1950s. Spencer would win an Academy uh, Spencer would win a technical Academy Award for this process, but the computer would soon render the APT process obsolete. The Black Culture is notable for being Disney's first animated feature film to incorporate computer-generated imagery in its animation for bubbles, a boat, a floating orb of light, and the culture itself. Though The Black Culture was released a year before The Great Mouse Detective, which I'll talk about in the next episode, stay tuned for that, both films were, pr were in production simultaneously for some time, and the computer graphics for the later uh, for the latter were done first. When producer Joe Hill heard about, about what was being done, the, poss the possibilities made him 
excited and he made the crew from the Rainbow Detective project create some computer animation for his own movie. For other for other effects, the animated Don Paul used live action footage of Dry's Mists to create steam and smoke coming out of the cauldron. <sighs> now you know, guy, good. We want to the soundtrack, The Black Cauldron. Original motion picture soundtrack is the soundtrack album to the film. It was composed and conducted by Albert Bernstein and originally released in 1985. In the composition, unlike most other Disney animated films, the film did not contain any songs. At the same time, Bernstein had just come off the success of his Academy Award nominated score for the 1983 film Tracy Places, as well as the score for the 1984 film Ghostbusters. Like in the latter two, the Black Cauldron saw the use of so it's all the use of the ghostly owned owned this uh Martinot to build upon the dark mood of Pride Dane. Oh no. We want to see the original release because of the films because of the film's last bit of revisions, much of Bernstein's a bunch of Bernstein's score was cut and unused. In its minority, the score was re-recorded for the album. For the album, or for the album originally released by Verese Sarabande in 1985, with the composer conducting the Utah Symphony Orchestra. The album soon fell out of print, and many of the film's tracks did not resurface until a bootleg copy entitled Tarad was supplied to soundtrack specialty outlets in 1986. And for the re release, the film tracks received their par premiere release in 2012 as part of a as part of Intrado Records' partnership with Walt Disney Records to issue some of several Disney film soundtracks. I know, that's good. We go on to the critical response. Yeah, we go on to the critical response. Yeah, the score received. <sighs> oh boy. We go on to the critical response. The score received. Uh, the score received positive reviews from music critics, and today is recorded as obscure but one of the best works by First D and for a Disney animated film. Jason and the Ankeny from All Music gave to the soundtrack a positive review. Stating that Bernstein's bleak, uh, bleak arrangements and ominous melodies vividly underline the fantasy world portrayed on screen, and taken purely on its own terms, the score is an undeniable success. The film score review website for the film tracks wrote the score for the Black Cauldron was for Bernstein, but Mulan was for Jerry uh, was for Jerry Jerry Goldsmith in the next decade. A fascinating journey into a fresh realm that requires music to play. A more significant role in the film. Mulan will be in a, in a future episode of the series, so keep your eyes peeled for it. Forgot to, uh, put up, forgot to put it out there, but that's okay. We want to release history, region in the United States. The, both in the United States, tape 1985, format, cassette, CD, and LP, various sister of Mede, and on April 3rd, 2012, CD, and digital download, multi records, and Drano records. That's all. We want to release. For its initial release, the the film became the first Disney animated film to receive a PG rating for the Motion Picture Association of America, which is now called the Motion Picture Association, so remember that. It was also presented in Super Tender Rama, the 70, the first since Sleeping Beauty, and Dolby Stereo, 70mm, six tracks surround sound. The film's initial theatrical release was accompanied by the Don Duck short, Chips Ahoy. The film was released was re released in 1990 in select, in select markets under the title, Tyrant and the Magic Cauldron. Uh-oh, this is going to be bad. The box office performance. The Black Culture was released in, 19, in North America on July 24th, 1985. Two days later, the film also screened at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. While officially budgeted by Disney executives at $25 million, the film's production manager, Don Hodge, said in his documentary, Waking Sleeping Beauty, that it costs $44 million to produce the film. The $44 million budget made it the most expensive animated film ever to make the May at the time. The film grossed $21.3 million domestically. It resulted in a loss for Walt Disney Productions and put the future of the animation department in jeopardy, earning the nickname, earning the nickname, the film that also killed Disney. The film that almost killed Disney. Oh boy, this is not gonna be good. It was not distributed as a home video release for more than a decade after its theatrical run, after its poor performance, after adding insult to injury. The film was also being at the box office by the Care Bears movie. With $22.9 million domestically, which was released four months earlier by the much smaller Canadian MHC in Nirvana, which happens to be a big one, currently on my course entertainment. Remember that. The film was, however, more successful outside North America, notably in France, where it had 30, where it had 3,074,481 emissions and was the fifth most attended film of the year. The film was the last just animated film to be completed at the original animation building of of the Walt Disney Studios, Walt Disney Productions, in Burbank, California. The animation department was moved 
excuse me, was moved to the Airway facility in nearby Glendale in 1984. And following corporate restructuring, eventually returned to, Bur to the Burbank studio in mid 1990s. Uh, in the mid 1990s, at a new facility. Whew, so that's nothing. Let's go to the critical reception. It's gonna be a big one. Brace yourself, people. It's gonna be big. On the review of aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes, the film had a, an approval rating of 55% based on 33 reviews, with an average score of 5.6 out of 10. The Chris consensus reads, Ambitious but flawed, the, the black culture is technically brilliant as usual, but lacks the compelling characters of other Disney anime classics. On Metacritic, the film had a weight average score of 59 out of 100, based on 16 critics, indicating mixed or average reviews. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times gave the film three, uh, gave the film three and a half stars out of four, praising the film as a rip roaring tale of swords and sorcery, evil and revenge, magic, and evil and revenge, magic and pluck and luck, and it takes us on a journey through a kingdom uh, of some of the most of the more memorable characters in any recent Disney film. He noted evolving the story. He noted, he noted how evolving the story was, and was felt, and was felt, and felt the key to the movie is in the richness of the characterizations. And the two best characters, I think, are the Horde King and a fuzzy little creature named Gurgi. Number forty-one. Uh oh, forty-one. I forgot to take it off. Sorry. A slight error here, but that's okay. Moving on. Charles Sullivan of the Los Angeles Times wrote that the highly dimensional soundtrack. With its opulent Elmer Bernstein score and excellent vocal performances, and is a technical technological work of art. But it is the animation with itself with some of the best work the studio has produced since Walt Disney's death in 1966 that dazzles the viewer. He felt that if its script and direction were equal to the animation, Cauldron would be a masterpiece to rank with Snow White and Pinocchio instead of the frustrating. A beautiful, exciting, and ultimately unsatisfying film that is. And by culture, I mean the black culture. Remember that. Walter Koeman, reviewing for the New York Times, praised the animation and John Hurt's performance, but people, with the P between, between two parentheses, between two parentheses, old enough to recall their delight at earlier feature animations, no doubt uh, burnished by memory, are not, of course, the audience at which the black culture is, all, is aimed. Nor, apparently, it is aimed at youngsters who have had a taste of more sophisticated animation of the Star Wars breed of movies. London's Time Out magazine deemed it, is, deemed it a major disappointment, adding that the charm, the character, the charm characterization, and sheer good humor found in previous Disney efforts are sadly upset. Charles Chaplin, also from the Los Angeles Times, wrote that the black culture lacks the, uh, the simplicity and clarity of great fairy tales. Or the child-shaped wonder of, of Marjorie Sharp's stories that became that became the rescuers, and we'll get to that in a future episode. Stay tuned for that coming soon. The last really successful Disney anime feature, one wonderful chase in the old in the old Ryan Disney inventive slapstick tradition, and two minor comic figures suggest the the pleasures that can result when the inventing animators. I have a fertile ground to start from, but a lot, uh, but a lot of the way the film seems to be did, uh, dull, uh, duty, dutifully following a rather cumbersome and not overly attractive story. Actually, I did talk about I did talk about the rescuers in a past episode. Well, actually, yes, I actually I was wrong. I did talk about uh, the rescuers in a past episode of movie history, Walt Disney Animation Studios. But where was it? Aha, uh -huh. they were featured on episode 23. So, yeah, The Rescuers was on episode 23. So, if you haven't seen Yango, we'll go to right now. Jeffrey Katzenberg, then chairman of the Walt Disney Studios, was dismayed by the product, by the product of any animators, believed that it lacked the humor, the pathos, and the fantasy which had been so strong in Loy Alexander's work. The story had been a once in a lifetime opportunity and was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking to see such wonderful material want wasted. Loy Alexander, the author of the books on which the film was based, had a more complex reaction to the film. First, I have to say, there is no resemblance between the movie and the book. Having said that, the movie in itself, purely as a movie, I found to be very enjoyable. 
I had fun watching it. What I would hope is that anyone sees the movie would certainly enjoy it. But I also hope that they actually read the book. The book is quite different. It's a very powerful, very movie story. And I think people would find a lot more depth in the book. So there you go. I'm, I did mention Snow White and Pinocchio. They were on episodes 1 and 2 respectively. And I did talk about Sleeping Beauty, which was on uh, episode 16. So I haven't seen yet. Go watch it right now. Moving on. Reception. Critical reception. Ah! I already did that. Let's skip that. We've got For Home Media. The Black Culture was first released on VHS in, in the United Kingdom in 1997 and the United States on August 4, 1998, as part of the Walt Disney Masterpiece Collection, a pan and scan transfer. 13 years after its theatrical release, the film, uh, the film received a DVD issue with a 2.20 by 1 non anamorphic widescreen transfer in 2000. Yeah, in 2000, as part of the Walt Disney Gold Classic Collection line, featuring an art gallery, a new game, The Quest for the Black Culture, and the 1982 Dog Shore Trick or Treat. Uh, sorry for sorry for the air, ladies and gentlemen. Forgot to take out that uh, to take out that last slide. It was from our previous episode. Ah, but yeah. Moving on. In 2008, Disney announced a special edition 25th a special edition DVD release of the film to be released in 2009, but was re-advertised as a 25th anniversary edition and re and released on September 14, 2010, in the US and UK. It contained the original 2.35 by one anamorphic widescreen transfer, the new Witch's Challenge game, and an unfinished deleted scene, and all the features for the 2000 DVD release. In November 2019, the film was released in 4K for the launch of Disney+. Plus. On May 4, 2021, the film was finally released on Blu-ray, exclusively through Disney Movie Club. Okay, that's good. We go on to the theme parks. Costume versions of the, char of the characters from the film have made occasional appearances at the Disney Parks and Resorts, mostly in Fantasyland. In 1986, the eatery Lancers in at Walt Disney World were renamed Gurgis, Munchies, and Crunchies. Eventually, in 1993, it was closed and then remodeled into Lumiere's Kitchen, the Village Fry Shop, and currently, the Friars Nook. On July 11, July 11 1986, Tokyo Disneyland opened Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour, a walkthrough attraction in which the Horde came makes an appearance. The attraction was in operation until 2006. To tie in with the attraction's opening, a 14-day special event and castle show, The Mystery of Cinderella Castle, yeah, was featured on the Cinderella Castle for Court stage, featuring Mickey Mouse, Tom Duck, and Goofy, with Princess Aurora, Prince Philip, and Maleficent from Sleepy Beauty, during the battle, during the battle against Maleficent's forces, by Goofy, Donald, Prince Philip, uh, Philip and Aurora, a cameo appearance is made by Creeper with other Disney villains. Again, go check out Sleepy Beauty on episode 16 of the series, so watch it out if you're not watching this one. And finally, for the video game, the video game The Black Culture was designed by Al Lowe of Sierra Online and released in 1986. It was made shortly after the King's, after the first King's Quest game, so it resembles the, that adventure in many ways. Along with the Dark Crystal, it remains one of, one of only a few adventure games by Sierra to be based on films. <sighs> so that's all I gotta say, and that's the end of the Black Culture, yay! We, we finally made it to the end of the episode, guys. Let's let's get to the final thoughts and rain for this movie. Mm, I gotta say, the Black Culture is not a good film. I gotta say, 50-50 yes, 50-50 no, but either way, I like this movie so much. But yes, you get the point, I feel fine, and so can you. And so that's, with, that, with all that being said, on scale 1 to 10, I'm gonna give the Black Culture a score of 6 out of 10. Okay, very okay. No, yes, we're right here, but yeah. So, uh, so yeah. What is abysmal? Two is terrible. Three is awful. Four is bad. Five is mad. Six is okay. Seven is good. Eight is great. Nine is amazing, and ten is perfect. For me, I'm giving it a six out of ten. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. A very okay film. A very mediocre film. Very decent, but yeah, you get the point. So yeah, definitely go get that watch. However, it's just my personal interest to pay you for feeds or create this video in the comment section below. And with that, it's over. Thanks for watching today. Thanks for watching the return of movie history. Walt Disney Animation Studios. Yeah, we got more episodes coming your way this month and all the way through 2022. So let's see you for it, guys. And don't forget, we have a new episode of Samurai Supremacy today as LKD battles against viability. So don't miss it, guys. Plus, on Moshi Monster Viability, we'll be looking at the uh the mushrooms. It's going to be a whole lot of fun, so stay tuned for it, guys. And don't forget, tomorrow we're going to be in Washington, D.C., so expect no video, so expect a, a touring video soon. <coughs> I know. And then, and don't forget, the next episode of Logo History is coming soon, as it'll be about, about uh, MNCTV and RCTI, and on Logo History 2, we'll be taking a look at KTVT, KTXA, WRCTV, Dogman, and WJTV. So this is be pretty good. And don't forget, new seasons of the Moshi Bachelor League and Locus and Moshi begin next year. 
Bushy Bunch Lee will go into Season 2, and Little Grace Bushy will go into Season 4. So people want to look out for these, for, for these new seasons returning soon. For now, thanks for watching. I'm Gus Sanchez. You will see you next time on Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. And make sure you join me again next time for Episode 26. I'm taking a look at The Great Mouse Detective. This is going to be a whole lot of fun, my friends. Baze is coming. It's all new, all fun. So stay tuned for a video coming soon. Until then, if, until then we're, it's been a lot of time since our last episode, so we haven't played this for you. Uh, a past episode, starting with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, all the way up to the Black Cauldron. So make sure you go check out the link to the playlist. It's up there at the top right corner screen. Click it on it and watch it right now. Also, today on day five of the Boshi Twists out of the counter, we get Twistmas Music Box. Oh boy. This is going to be pretty exciting. I'll have that for you on the channel coming very, very soon. So please stay tuned for it. Otherwise, you're, you're a great audience. I love, I love each and every single one of you. So thank you all for watching today. Please remember to leave a like, share this video with your friends, leave a comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Also, turn on notifications to have this new video. Please subscribe to notifications to draw to have this new video for me as we're on the road to 1,500 subscribers. This is going to be a whole lot of fun, guys. With all that said, guys, thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next and Boshi Monsters by later on today. I'm Miko Sanchez, and it's great to have all of you back from, from Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studio. So thank you all for watching today, and I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Until next time, like, favorite, subscribe. Thank you all for watching today. I'm Miko Sanchez, and I will see you in another video. See you real soon. <laughs> Laters.